Welcome to Slight Reliability, the show where we learn SRE and observability one week at a time. I'm Stephen Townsend. Welcome back to Slight Reliability. I'm Stephen Townsend, and this is the show where we learn about SRE and observability one week at a time. Today on the show, I have Eric Chabelle from Chronosphere. Uh, Eric is Chronosphere's Director Evangelism. He is renowned for in the development community as a speaker, a lecturer, author, and a baseball expert. His current role allows him to help the world understand the challenges they are facing with cloud-native observability. He brings a unique perspective to the stage with a professional life dedicated to sharing his deep expertise of open source technologies, organizations, and as a CNCF ambassador. So welcome. Thank you. Nice to be here. Yeah. This has been one of my sources for learning about uh, about SRE world and about the observability over the last year or so. Oh, that's good. (laughs) <laughs> There's been some clever people who have come on the show. Yeah, I'm learning yeah. a lot too. Yeah. Is there anything I missed from you or by anything you want to tell us about yourself? Yeah, the only the only thing I think that's a little bit interesting uh, from my perspective that, that the audience might want to know about is uh, I spent probably about 25 years in the app dev space. So as a, you know, starting off as a developer, uh, coding, Java, all that kind of stuff through the years, which, which is not something you'd expect to find me on a site reliability podcast, right? And uh, about a year and a half ago, I decided to, to step into this role in this organization. And it's, it's a new world, right, for me. And, and it's, it's been kind of fun because I'm also someone that's used to documenting the experience and sharing what I do. I'm a teacher, basically, in, in this kind of a role. And uh, so I've, I've spent some time uh, uh, with a, a series called uh, Ollie Guide, uh, step for step on my process, like what I'm learning, what I'm seeing, what I'm doing, a lot like what you're doing through this podcast. Uh, mine's just a little bit wider <laughs> of a view because the cloud native observability is a big topic. So what made you, what attracted you to observability? Was that something you were working in that space before or was it a, a brand new field almost? Well, so I, I noticed when, when you're working in technical marketing or, or as a developer advocate, you start talking about a certain direction of technology, a strategy, you know, you start, start developing insights and, and sharing and growing in that direction. And it might take you left, it might take you right, depending upon your personal interests. And I noticed that I was starting to observe in, in cloud native development and cloud native environments and containers and Kubernetes and all the CNCF stuff. I was very much noticing that cloud data is an issue, right? You know, customers are getting getting hammered. You know, it's it's become like mainstream now. But imagine about two years ago, people were pretty shocked and stunned that when you go into a, a marketing marketplace on on any of the major providers and you click on something to use it as a developer. You're spinning up stuff, you're enjoying your stuff, and I'm building a demo, and it's all fantastic and syncing and whatever with GitHub and, and all that stuff. And then I get the bill after a week of building a demo, and it's 800 bucks, and I'm like, hey, you know what? what? <laughs> and it turns out it's got a lot to do with the observability stuff that's just dumping data on me that I'm not using as a developer. So that, that was my first experience. Uh, the second thing is I started digging into that, and so I spent the better part of a year on stage talking and warning people about this. I have a really uh, uh, talk that I've repeated many times called the three pitfalls everyone should avoid with cloud data. And that's been so well received that you like, you know, you're on to something, right? So then, then I started thinking about what's next after I'm going to gonna move on to a new role and the observability stuff kind of popped up in my list of interviews. And they had been looking at what I've been talking about and then asked me what I thought about it. I'm like, yeah, so I haven't sat as you know, SRE on call that much, but I've seen the impact of the results of these large at scale deployments in the cloud with customers that are fairly huge in my old role across the globe and everybody's struggling with the same thing. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of how, uh, how it sucked me in because I was like, yeah, this seems like what I'm interested in. This is where my strategy and my discussions are taking me. And I'm really excited to get into new technology. It's, it's really, really fun. Mm-hmm. And uh, where I'm at now, the founders come from uh, Netflix, did this at scale, uh, have been through it all. And there's so much to learn from these guys. So it's, it's, it's been a fantastic first year for me here at Chronosphere. The, the sort of general topic we were thinking about discussing was around dashboarding. Uh, and yeah. one of the things, this is maybe just my impression, but I get the sense that in the cloud native observability or modern observability community, that metrics are somewhat, not, I wouldn't go so far as to say they're maligned, but there's a there's certainly a, a weighting towards distributed tracing is the way to go, and that is the key to modern observability. But hey, dashboards are metrics, right? That's what we're plotting. So I guess my question is, and this is more of a general 
starting point for discussion. What is the place of dashboards or of metrics in general in modern observability? Ah, <laughs> so if I have this answer, we're, we're done. <laughs> we yeah. call it a day and then yeah. retire. Um, <laughs> I think I think a little bit what you're touching on is the transition between what we've seen, uh, where you have application performance monitoring kind of uh, organizations and tooling, where metrics are your big focus. Uh, you understand the environment; it's not auto scaling. It's not you know what I mean. It's a very targeted environment, sort of what we could consider the second generation of, of observability, to where we're at now, where it's large born in the cloud companies that have done this at massive scale or started at a smaller scale, but it explodes through the setup, through the Kubernetes auto scaling. Uh, when they become successful, we saw in the pandemic, uh, many, many companies just, just scale through the roof, right? I mean, the whole business patterns changed and how we lived our lifestyles, uh, door dashes and things like that. So I, I, I don't think uh, the, the story should be anything about uh, just technical aspects. Like people always like to talk about uh, uh, metrics, tracings, logs, you gotta have that. Yeah. <laughs> what are you doing with this stuff is, is more important and, and how you're approaching this and from a business standpoint is how you're getting the answers that you're looking for in these dashboards. Mm -hmm. And so uh, something that we talk a lot about here at, at Chronosphere is uh, we, we like to uh, know, triage and understand. And you notice all three of these words are business words. They're not a technological focus. And, and, I like to explain this stuff from the open source world. People love to talk about the technology and the functionality, but when you try to sell that, you're talking to the developer at the bottom of the pile. And that's not the decision makers at the top. They're trying to figure out how to, you know, it's all fantastic. There's nothing wrong with that, but it's a different aspect of how you're approaching the problems that these businesses are dealing with. And so when you look at the third generation of observability, we're no longer interested in just tracking metrics, just tracking traces, just tracking logs. Fantastic. I can make a dashboard and dump a big old log in your face. Does that change anything? You know, it changes nothing. And so what you're trying to figure out is a way to have alerts trigger something to get somebody to a dashboard that starts the investigative process and leads you down to the answer, sort of like good documentation does, which is one of the analogies I like to use a lot with dashboards. Uh, good documentation for any project takes a lot of effort. It's a constant thing. Uh, it's improving all the time. It's adjusting all the time. And the idea is that you're digging down through a bunch of docs to get to where your answer is. You're not grabbing this pile of docs and then switching to this pile of docs and switching to that pile of docs. That's what happens in a lot of those second generation organizations where they've been going at it so long in a certain form with just metrics, mm -hmm. all these dashboards all over the place that are just disjunct and maybe a link between them. But you know, the, the idea is having your, your and, and I think you've had my colleague Paige on here where she talks about you know, when you're on call, she, she, she's the youngest retired SRE, right? She's burned <laughs> out and done and doesn't want to do it anymore. <laughs> this last, I, I maybe shouldn't say this cat personal thing, but this last Christmas, she was like, she was like, call, you know, sending me text messages for, hey, this is the first time I haven't been on call. She was so happy. <laughs> you know? And that's because you, you're on call, you know, when it goes off, oh shit, how am I going to figure out and how am I going to dig through this stuff? The idea is you want to land on a, a, on a starting point which includes maybe documentation, a few simple things, maybe the alert message that got triggered, and then we go down into that deeper and deeper until we figure it out. And when it's done well, you don't even have to have super rock star, you know, technologically advanced <laughs> SREs. You can train younger ones to do this to a certain point. And, and that's the ideal world, right? That's the nirvana. And being able to know that the something is going on Mm -hmm. Being able to triage it really quickly and, and remediate within those two steps somewhere. And remediation doesn't have to mean rolling back what you just did. It could also just be filtering out that metrics cardinality spike that you had happen. Stop it right there. Contact some people and find out what they want to do from that point on. You just saved the company a ton of money by not, you know, storing all this extra labels and stuff that have been generated. And then being able to always go back and understand deeply what happened so you can fix it or adjust maybe your dashboard approach or adjust some of the documentation for the next person that might encounter something like this. And so that's kind of the vision with the, with the, with the no triage understand approach that I think brings us a, a lot farther than just talking about, Hey, metrics are outdated. What the hell are you doing? I don't think it matters to anybody when they get to their alert and they come into the office 
if it was a metric, a log, or a trace, or if it was one metric, uh, three traces, and you know, two lines in a log that got me the answers I needed, they really don't care. So I would rather have a unified uh, experience that, that embeds this some way in some form in the dashboards as I go through my documentation dive to figure out what's going on. So many things I'm hearing from there. One of the, <laughs> Sorry to dump on you. <laughs> one, one of them is that, as you said, uh, dashboards are a bit like documentation. And documentation, it, it's a source of technical debt in a way because you're creating something which has a use. But if you don't keep maintaining it, it loses its value. Uh, and I've certainly seen situations where dashboards just build, build up, build up, build up, get out of date, don't even work anymore, and get left. And they're just sitting yeah. there you know, wasting away. In the sort of modern era when things are moving fast and they're really complex, a dashboard's a thing that people can still create and craft them manually to tell stories, or are they more the kind of thing that we should be using automated scripts to generate based on templates and that kind of thing? I would love to have both, you know, as long as they're successful, right? Mm -hmm. it, 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 I don't think uh, the journey is important. I think the end results is important. I spent some time in the military and they used to always tell us the, the fastest uh, distance between two points is a straight line, right? <laughs> so quit trying to go around stuff, go straight through it. And I feel like you're looking to get to the end results where you're not burning out your, your developers and your engineers, your on-call team, where you're looking to get remediation done faster, where customer experiences are better, where we, we have good insights into what's going on. When you can do these things, then the cost is not such an issue. The cost gets to be an issue when you're unable to achieve these things. Mm. And then people start scratching their head. Why am I paying more for observability than I am for, you know, observability data than I am for my actual production and customer data and stuff that's getting me money. This needs to be balanced by this. And when it's not, it's full stop. And what the hell are we doing time? And um, I think uh, uh, auto generating stuff would be fantastic. If that works great. You know, everybody's prominent AI is going to take care of all this, right? <laughs> we can just plug in the, the on-call AI bot. I think that, uh, I mean, not, not be predictive on AI or anything, but it's just, I think it's something that's going to evolve that might find niche yeah. cases where it's going to work. I mean, I, I always like to refer back, back in the day when I first started at university doing a computer sciences degree here, uh, we had AI promising us medical you know, diagnosis and everything's going to be fantastic and no more mistakes by doctors, or at least 99% of the stuff was going to be covered by these AI things. It's still not happening. You know what I mean? And you're like... Here it is again, coming back around. Now it's our, our better search engine chatbot, you know? And I'm like, I don't know. It seems kind of kind of strange that it's gonna fix everything. So that, that part right there, like auto-generating your dashboards, I don't, I don't know anybody's gonna put that much effort into it. I, I, I couldn't imagine. My, my experience is with, with APM tooling and, and that has like AI stuff doing this and that. I, I've always found it just generates a, a ton of garbage unless you, consciously configure it in, in certain ways so that it understands your context. And then at that point, it's like, well, how AI is this? It's just, yeah. I'm feeding in so much to it anyway. Uh, and, I, and I also have like horrible flashback. I did performance testing for 13 years and all oh. of these tools that you would get in, we do automatic, automatically correlate dynamic values and blah, blah, blah. It never, ever worked. And then when something goes wrong, um, because it's all automatically done, you, you give no idea how to fix it. No, it didn't matter. Like even my 13th year, I always did things manually. I forgot about all that. I want to do it manually because I want to understand what the yeah. client and the server are saying to each other every step of the way. Well, if you think, if you think about, if I look back at the development days where I was coding and, and using a, a, an IED and when you deploy something, the most dynamic it got as far as services and stuff is you'd have a, a service bus. You might have a, a lookup service that you can find the services you want to call. And I was like, you know, you're putting breakpoints. Like, it's very, very static, very, you know, it's, it's, it's nothing like it is now. And then you see people having to deal with, as a developer, uh, uh, telemetry data and what happened the last time I made this call out into the wild and where did it go and why. And, you know, these looking at traces and, and spans and, and it's no longer just a, a, an ops kind of thing. And I always kind of had this little hidden joke in all the talks I did around DevOps where I'm like, I, I seriously come from the dev side, right? That's what I love. That's why I signed up for it. That's why I came to this, this role wherever I'm at at that time. And then we talk about DevOps, but why am I doing, and, and one of our research uh, things that came out this last year, talked to 500 engineers and 10 hours a week are spent on triaging and dealing with issues and you know, deployment problems and whatever. 
Do you think I, as a developer, signed up for, for, for that much? You know what I mean? This is not making me happy. You wonder why they're stressed, burn out, and they don't want to do the job. If you wanted to do that, then you should have got somebody that wanted to do that, right? But that's his thing. And, and they're, they're out there. You know what I mean? There's people that do admin stuff that prefer to do that, don't want to develop. Fair enough. It's plenty of room in everybody's world. <laughs> do what you want to do. And why would you do something you don't want to do in our business when there's so many openings and so much shortage on resources, right? Yeah. And yeah, that's, that's, that's really rough, right? And so the dashboard thing, I, you see that creeping more and more into the developer space also, because when you have an observability uh, team or centralized observability that can make stuff available for developers in certain environments, I mean, that basic knowledge of, of what's happening with like memory usage and things like that is, is much easier than me trying to figure it out from my IDE these days. I mean, let's be honest. How many plugins am I going to put in my VS code? <laughs> I can, it's, it's off the planet, right? What you can do with this stuff nowadays. So that's kind of my semi rant in that direction. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting what you're saying about developers having to take on this new responsibility. And I think I've never really thought about it like that before, because I thought about it from an organizational perspective. We, you know, if you have people who understand the context of the code that's being written, surely they can, you'd have an easier time sort of debugging things uh, as opposed to the separate isolated team. But then I never really thought about the individuals and now, Hey, you've got to do all this extra, these extra skills and things that you may not like doing. I'll take yeah, that with me. <laughs> and it's, it's hilarious. I have a slide somewhere in one of my talks and it comes directly out of a, a, one of the chat things online where somebody was asking, hey, open telemetry and tracing, what is this, all this stuff? Is this valuable for me to integrate into my, my observability stack? Mm -hmm. And the first really dry, sarcastic reaction that came back was, I can't even get my develop. I have a, you know, I'm in an organization about a thousand developers, blah, blah, blah. I can't even get them to look at metrics, let alone tracing. <laughs> And I was like, oh, you know, it, it doesn't matter how great your tooling is, man. It really doesn't and, and what it delivers if they're not interested. You know what I mean? If you can't get anybody to pick up the tool, what the hell? And yeah. I like to point out, I mean, how many times have you seen uh, somebody out in his garden doing some work on some woodwork or whatever, and he's nailing up a fence or some shit. And, you know, what do you do? A nail, a hammer, right? But you see the guy out there with a wrench whacking a nail, right? Because <laughs> that's the closest thing he's got at hand. I don't care how great your hammer is. If it's just out of reach, he's not going to go get it. <laughs> you know <what> I, mean? <laughs> I, I think, yeah, for the vast majority of people who work in technology, they just work for regular organizations. They don't work for you know, Meta or you know, Google or you know, Amazon or something like that. And they don't work for some unicorn startup either. They work for like a, a like I work for an insurance company or a bank or a government department or yeah. something. And, and most of my experience in those organizations is that you know, setting up distributed tracing at an organization level is nearly impossible. Uh, you will be patches of getting some pretty advanced stuff going, but you know, that's not the world that's very difficult when there's so much history uh, and yeah. maybe the culture isn't technology first. I also think it's, it's, you know, getting us back to the dashboards and stuff. If you're, if you're bringing all this into the organization, wouldn't it be nice if it was just part of the integrated experience? Like I said, where we find, you know, it turns out this time around two spans, uh, half a trace, and, and a log line was all I needed to figure it out. The guy behind the screen doesn't give a crap what you use to get there. So integrating your traces in your organization in this fashion is a different story than saying, hey, go to my uh, dashboard for uh, open telemetry and start digging into the Jaeger things. And, you know, look, and he's like, what? You know? <laughs> and there ends up being like three people in the org that actually use it and, and get value out of it. It's really funny, we put together a, a in, in our product, we have a, the ability to look at some of the data that you're ingesting, your metrics data, whatever it is. It doesn't really matter whether it's where it's coming from, but it's, it's all flowing in. You can see it live, but you can also do a flip a switch and it'll show you everything that is not being used at all. So it, it sorts it from the, the least used to the, to the most used metrics. And uh, it, it even lets you dive down into the labels. If you find something that is used, it has like half its labels aren't being touched. You can filter that stuff out before you persist. It saves you a lot of money, right? That's the way most of the stuff works. What was really interesting is we found a couple of examples where something was being used by two uh, SREs, but these were the two most experienced and rockstar SREs. And the guy that saw that during a pilot was like, hey, what's going on with these two? Let's go talk to them why they think this is important. Maybe we need to include this for everybody else. <laughs> And it turned out it was an addition to a dashboard that, that could help a lot more people in the organization with what they were mm. looking at. I'm like, that's the kind of stuff you want to find. That's the kind of stuff you need to expose in your dashboards, not 
we have tracing, go to the tracing dashboard. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's how it's individually used and, and where the value is in the data you have coming in for your organization. That's why a lot of the questions that you and I've talked about uh, leading up to this, it's really hard to give a definitive answer because it's really like, is it a small organization you're describing? Yeah. Is it somebody that's not that deep into the cloud native stuff? Is it somebody that's full blown at scale? Is it, what's your use case for that specific on-call person you're trying to set up the alerts for, right? What, what, what area are we dealing with? What business metrics are important to you? You know, what do you want to know, triage and understand in this environment? It's always different for each one we get into. It's mm. always different. I have this topic and I've, I've titled it beautiful and ugly dashboards. I am the beholder. I am the beholder. I just, I, I interviewed uh, Jamie Allen, a guy called Jamie Allen this morning, also similarly about dashboards, focusing on the whole deal idea of a single pane of glass. And we we're ah. talking, talking about how he, he had worked with an organization once who had an entire wall of single pane, panes of glass, which are just <laughs> filled with widgets, like an entire wall of just TV screens back to back to back. Uh, which no one ever looks at, but they look beautiful. Yeah. They look stunning. Yeah. Well, so, have you ever been to like, uh, I was once in Boston and I think that's the headquarters of Akamai. Yep. And Akamai runs like all the world internet. So they're, they're huge, right? They have a glass area on the street where you can look into like their centralized operations. I don't know if that's what it is or not, but that's the impression they're giving. And man, is that a wall of dashboards and <laughs> screens and stuff. It looks like command central for NORAD. <laughs> you know, it's... I don't know what it's about. I don't know if they know what it's about, but it's, there's a lot of stuff up on the wall and a lot of numbers going by and a lot of, you know, lines being connected. And well, maybe know. someone from Ankamai is listening and they can confirm for us what that's all about. Is it just yeah. for show or is it really being used? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's super impressive, which is probably what they're trying to do. And I'm sure some of that's interesting when they need to dive into a specific one for whatever they're doing. But, hmm. but when you walk by something like that, you just kind of scratch your head and you're like, yeah. <laughs> Almost reaching the points of, uh, I mean, how do... Look at the dashboard that a uh, that a uh, uh, air traffic controller has to deal with. Relatively simple, is it is almost a single pane of glass? But good God, how do they do that? You know, mm. it's pretty impressive. So, what was his view on single pane of glass? Was he all in on it or? His view was that it is useful, provided that, like you were saying, that it helps you triage, and it has yeah. to be simple enough that you basically know here is a thing. Does it have a problem? If it does, I need to better drill down to the next layer to at least yeah. understand which area the problem is in before we get into the more detailed analysis. That was his view. And I, I completely agree with that. So for me, it's like, uh, I, I understand when it's a single pane of glass, you have one starting point. Mm -hmm. For me, the single pane of glass goes away the minute you can dive down deeper, right? So yeah. now it's no longer a single pane. You have multiple panes you're diving down into, in, in my opinion. But so I feel like it's a cop out to say you have a single pane of glass because nobody can achieve that unless you have a dashboard that's like 50 foot by 60 foot and has everything in the, you know, it's flattening it out into a single pane. The idea of not going any deeper. <laughs> I suppose, I suppose. <laughs> I, I think of it more as if, if you can have a single view and maybe it's only theoretical, maybe it's not real. If you can have a single view which can tell you, answer the big questions that you need to know about something. You know, and I think it comes down to context, right? Uh, it might yes. be, I have a very simple service. Is my, can my customers use my service? And are they having a good time? If I can answer that question in one place, I would call that a single pane of glass, but I don't know. Another sort of cliche about dashboards, as I, I've, I've been in offices where you've got these TV screens with dashboards up showing the health of infrastructure and applications and services and so on. A lot of people work from home now. And I was wondering, how, you know, as a person working from, working from home, when when do you go and look at dashboards? Do you have to build a routine to go and check up on them or is it triggered by an alert that brings you to a dashboard? Is that sort of the model that you see or? Yeah, yeah, I think it's more that. I mean, there's always running dashboards just to see, you know, for example, is a, a really famous one is like they have a bunch of boxes at the top that might represent business areas of services, so whatever, like an order service and whatever that they're doing. Are they, are they green? Are they red? Are they yellow? What, what do they look like? And what does that mean? That has to mean something to you, but I assume green is good. Red is bad, you know, that kind of thing. So that, that's, that's just one you'd browse through, right? How, how's the business doing right now? That's got nothing to do with uh, where you're going to start your triaging thing other than, yeah, maybe you're looking for a red one, but generally speaking, alerts are tied to bringing you into uh, uh, an area of the business that you're covering with that, that, that you know, that on-call service you're doing. And uh, there should be a starting point that, that narrows it down much more than look at the whole business. Okay, this, this, 
you're trying to save some steps. So I think you get launched into what I see the most. You get launched into uh, a little bit narrower view, and uh, we definitely try to try to do that. That you're uh, quantifying it down to something that then you drill down into directly, and it unifies the metrics, the traces, and, and all that. You introduced me to something I'd never heard of before called uh, the Percy's Project, which is a, yeah. a project about dashboarding, and I probably should have known about it because it's considering I work for a dashboarding vendor. Uh, so but I was curious, well, what, what is the Percy's Project? Just so um, <clears throat> That is something that got, got kicked off uh, right after Grafana uh, uh, changed their licensing uh, not too long ago. They, they announced that they were going to require, if you're embedding it in a product as a vendor, um, it's, it's basically the, the, it was the open source standard of what you would go use as a dashboarding starting point. So everybody had it everywhere. Uh, being true open source, just like a, a lot of the stuff I encountered while I was working at Red Hat, people embed open source everywhere. They use the tools where they want to use them. Um, they changed the Apache license so that if you're embedded it, you have to you know, return any changes you make back into the community. And that kind of makes it a no-go for a lot of vendors, of course. Mm. So uh, looking for some way to get to a, nat you know, a native dashboarding uh, framework, uh, I do know, uh, I, I built a workshop around it just because I was fascinated by what was going on with this. It was really early days, so it was not so much drag and drop. It was more, you know, doing actual YAML or JSON code to get your dashboard together. Um, it's a bit far-fetched to expect people to do that, but I mean, it was such early days that, that that's the condition it was in. Um, but you saw really quickly places like Amadeus, uh, even Red Hat people are involved. So you see there's a real co coalition around interest in this space. And plus, people have been working with dashboards so long, they think, hey, we can do it better this time, right? As you do in open source. So you end up with a, a cleaner, more performant kind of uh, framework, I think, is, is where it's headed. And we're not uh, deeply involved in the sense of, of leading the project or anything like that. Uh, but we have, we have people that are, are, are active in that space. You, you see them on the, on the channels of the community. They use Matrix as sort of a, a web like IRC from the day uh, to chat about stuff. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, I, I find it utterly fascinating. It's, it's a really clean looking dashboard. It's, it's a dashboard, right? It's just a tool and, and how hard can it be kind of uh, experience you have. Uh, but it's, it's, it's not about the, the, the project you're using to build the dashboard. It's about what you're doing to make your dashboards effective for your people. Yeah. So I don't get too deep into what you're using to do your dashboards. It's all good for me. <laughs> I have a heavy bias for open source all through my career since I started. I've been involved in lots of projects in lots of different places and contributed and wrote books about the stuff. And I, I, I like open source projects and it's really fun to, to get hooked into one so early and see it grow. And uh, rumor has it they're going to, by the end of this year, launch their project officially, probably through the PromCon EU uh, I've heard rumors that that's what they're trying to do. So I'm going to, you know, update my workshop, make sure it's available as like a supporting piece for them. Is the project something that practitioners can use to, for their own work, or is it more the kind of thing which would um, vendors use to embed dashboarding in their products or both? Uh, both. I mean, any, anybody can use it for whatever you want and there's no limitations because it's back to an open source license. So. It sounds cool. And, and it sounds like it's more than just a, it's not just a tool. It's a, an open standard for dashboard visualization that's what they're looking for yeah so there there there's a core dash was the original uh, overarching thing and I, I believe it's been included in the linux foundation to start with there was talk of moving into cncf maybe one day i mean it's it's such early days that's all kind of speculation right now first you need to build something and they'll come you know <laughs> We're nearly out of time, but I did have one question for you. As someone coming from the sort of development uh, world, have you got any advice for anyone who's who's currently working as a developer, but is thinking about or is maybe being sort of pushed into a more operations type uh, role or mixed DevOps role? Run. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. No. Um, yeah, I mean, I think you kind of have to embrace it these days. My generic advice about any role you have, any anything you're doing in your job and in your, your professional life is uh, you, you come into a new role. If we start from like the new role to being more advanced in the role. So you come into the role new, you spend probably 99% of your time doing what they're asking you to do, trying to figure out what's going on, trying to embed yourself into the activities that are going on in your environment. Fair enough. Um, the whole goal is to narrow this down to 90%, then you have 10% playroom to figure out what you like and to, to invest into what you like within the role. 
maybe maybe spend more time on development than on ops or maybe spend more time on kubernetes than on you know java language or whatever it is or on certifications or whatever it happens to be and then pretty soon you get that down as you get more and more senior that 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 playroom gets bigger because you're more effective you're able to produce more than enough work to cover what is expected of you and you start being able to hobby and to improve what's around you like maybe invest in pipelines or you know, making things automated or, or make it easier for new developers coming in or spend some time on documentation or dashboards or whatever it happens to be. So I would say my advice is if you can't get to a point where you're doing maybe 70, 30, uh, you don't see that happening. I don't think you're ever going to be happy where you're at. And I think all of us do this in some form or another. Uh, I mean, are you having fun doing these, these podcasts? I'm sure this is kind of a thing you carved out in the role. It wasn't something they described from day one. Hmm. That's what happens. You start making fun things part of what your work is. And if you can't find that, we spend so much time at work in our lives, then you probably need to find a different role, right? <laughs> and if and, and that run is a joke, but that if it's really not your thing to do that kind of operation stuff, then maybe you don't want to do that. Then go find a silly developer role in the corner where you can just code. If that's really what makes you happy, then go do that. I have friends that do that. They, they absolutely love that. They're, they're experts in their, their languages and stuff like that. So be it. It's whatever makes you happy and gets you with a big smile behind your computer every day. And uh, you're, you're not going to function well if you're you know, not finding that happiness. Your so that, that would be my biggest thing after all the years I've done. I constantly strive to, to, to find hobby projects within my work. And they tend to align with work in some form. It's not that I'm just off to Red Sox writing while I'm working at work. <laughs> that, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about... Uh, uh, you know, developing workshops or, or, or writing about architectures that are on the edge of what we're doing, but one day are going to be relevant. It just interests me, you know, it's, it's my interest. So if you can't expand your own horizons, what the heck, you know, <laughs> maybe it's time to find a new place. I think that's good advice. I mean, hey, this podcast was a hobby of mine I did in my spare time in the weekends. Someone saw it, squared up, um, saw it and said, hey, that's... That's exactly what we want for our, our business, and here I am hey, doing it for a go. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Eric, for coming on the show and talking about dashboards and everything else we talked about. Uh, <laughs> and uh, that's all from another episode of Slight Reliability, and I will see you all next week.